Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today in this session of BC Forests, the People's Convergence. I'm Jennifer Houghton, and I'm speaking to you from Grand Forks, which is the traditional territory of the Selic, the Sinaixt, and the Tunaha people. And today, I'm incredibly honored to be here with Nancy Turner and Geraldine Manson. So we're going to hop right into their presentation. I'm really looking forward to this. And uh, I'll start by introducing Nancy, and then Nancy will introduce Geraldine, and then we'll be honored with a song from Geraldine. So uh, welcome, Nancy. Uh, Thank Nancy, you very much. Thank you. And Nancy Turner is an ethnobotanist and a distinguished professor emeritus School of Environmental Studies at the University of Victoria. She has worked with First Nations elders and cultural specialists in Northwestern North America for over 50 years, helping to document, retain, and promote their traditional knowledge of plants and environments, including indigenous foods, materials, and traditional medicines. Her two volume book, Ancient Pathways, Ancestral Knowledge, integrates her long-term research. And she's co-authored or co-edited 30 other books including Plants of the Haida Gwaii and Plant Foods of Coastal First Peoples. Her latest edited book is Plants, People, and Places, The Roles of Ethnobotany and Ethnoecology in Indigenous Peoples' Land Rights in Canada and Beyond. Wow, that's, that's an exciting title. I'm really looking forward to that one. So thank you so, so much, Nancy. Nancy uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to you now. Okay. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for that kind introduction. And it's a, a real honor to be here with my friend Geraldine Manson uh, and, uh, and all of you who are, who are listening. I really appreciate your interest. So we're going to be talking uh, today about um, First Nations knowledge, practices, stewardship of forests and the importance of forests in Indigenous people's cultures languages and so forth. Haich Kusiam, Gilakasla, Hawa. Um, I want to thank uh, the, especially the First Nations of the region where we are now on Vancouver Island, the Snanemoch, Tsumenas, Coatzin, and other Coast Salish peoples, whose peoples have cared for these lands and waters for countless generations. And where I am now um, on Protection Island is Nunemuch traditional territory. Um, there are a lot of people that we have to thank, uh, people in the Sierra Club, Eco Forestry Institute Society, and all of those who have brought you the, this programming and people who have worked in the field of ecoforestry. Um, I want to raise my hands to all of you. And it is such a pleasure for me to introduce Geraldine Manson to you. She is an elder in residence at Vancouver Island University. And uh, she's well recognized for the wealth of cultural knowledge and traditional practices and language that she holds and has been so generous in sharing with so many. She's working right now on a book on Snanemo traditional place names with over uh, 70 traditional place names in her territory. And um, this is going to be a real treasure uh, for so many people as we try to learn about the importance of place. Um, I think it's really great to learn the names of these places in the original languages. So Geraldine, um, welcome to this program and uh, I'll let you take it away from there. We're going to be sharing this presentation over the next few uh, hours. So, thank you. Asiem, siem estimo, siem siaya antepatsatasia sinemo, the elder in residence in Vancouver Island. My traditional name is Satasia, my English, Geraldine. Manson, elder for within the Sinemo community, but also for Vancouver Island University. I raise my hands and thank uh, my dear friend Nancy for recognizing, you know, because 
as an individual, normally you don't recognize your own within you, what you hold. And it reflects me back to the days when I was just an individual. This wealth of knowledge of all the things I hold, practices, culture, history, and language came from my old people and actually be mentored me for over 17 years repetitively and uh, never wrote anything down that uh, was given to me. Um, but I think, you know, if it wasn't for beautiful elders sharing knowledge and passing it down so it won't be lost, it still exists today. And I raise my hands to every one of them that have mentored me are gone, each one. I recall my late mother-in-law saying to me, you will be our voice, our legs, and our eyes when we can no longer do so. Never knew what she meant then, I know now. Because their teachings, their passing, their wisdom, from the land to the mountains to the rivers and back to the land and all its beautiful resources, it's what I hold. And I begin sharing over and over not only on university, but within my own family and community. Sharing is, is a beautiful word. Mm-hmm. With that, I think about my Auntie Ellen Colossalwit. The song, ha ha, ha ha, you are sacred on this land. Ha ha, ha ha, ha ha. Hi, John. Ha, 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 I am I I I I I I I I of the land. I raise my hands thanking you for this most beautiful day and these most beautiful moments that we journey through. Each one is so special, carrying us forward. Acknowledging who we are and what we share is so vital today. Today, great creator, Salelo to the land, witness the work that is about to be done. And you will see our elders will be raising their hands to us once more for the work that we do and carry for them forward. Haichika Sitsotsiam, Haichika Salelo to the land. Who? CM and Solelo is the creator and the guardian angels that we look to to our prayers. Our old people, like Auntie Ellen, Haichal Chacha was her her song that she made. And it means from the mountains to the rivers to the ocean, the land that we walk is sacred and embraces you with all that beautiful wisdom. Thank you. Geraldine, that was just beautiful and a beautiful way to start our presentation today. I wanted to show all of you just a, a little uh, snapshot of the work that Geraldine's been doing with the place names around Nanaimo, for, uh, the Nanaimo place names. And you can see um, there are many, many places that uh, have these beautiful names. And um, I look forward to learning these names. And I hope a lot of other people do as well because we need to bring back some of those names. Heichka. And uh, 
Geraldine's already spoken about some of the precious elders who have been our teachers, both of us, over the years. Um, and her Auntie Ellen is pictured in the, in the lower corner of, of this group of wonderful people. Um, I've had the privilege of learning from all of these people and um, what we're sharing with you, each of us has learned from these knowledgeable people. So we raise our hands to all of these wonderful people. I'll just name them very quickly, starting uh, at the top left, Ida Jones from Pachidat, Clan Chief Adam Dick, Waxisala Wakla, Kim Rakamaklutisi, Okolokwa, Dr. Daisy Seward Smith, Maya Neil, Helen Clifton from Hartley Bay, and uh, Ellen White, of course, Dr. Ellen White, Dr. Lucy Marvid Charlie, Dr. Mary Thomas, Dr. Ronald Ignace from the Skechiston Swetmuk Nation, and what I call the four Bella Kula grannies, the New Hulk Nation grannies. Uh, I worked with in the early 70s and 80s, Margaret Cy Wallace, Elsie Jacobs, Alice Talio, and Felicity Wakas. Those are just a few of the dozens and dozens of people who have shared their knowledge, and we share it now with you in a good way. Um, I wanted to put this map in right away uh, so that you could see the diversity that we have of both cultures and of environments. So we see the different First Nations. I'm sorry that you can't read the, the names of the different peoples living in different territories, but you can see that there are about um, 40 or, or 50 different First Nations territories and language, languages spoken in uh, Northwestern North America. And then over on the right-hand side, you see the major um, biogeoclimatic zones or, or vegetation regions, which each of which has their own special habitats. And forests are a part of almost all of these, except for the alpine zone and the coastal, uh, extreme coastal zones. So for, if you think about the entire land being covered with forests of one sort or another, um, forests are homelands for First Nations. And they're far more than just wood or just lumber. Forests are alive and full of complex relationships, including relationships with people. And um, Geraldine, feel free to add to anything I say at any time. I'll just give you a chance to say what you're thinking. And this, um, as you look at the forest as our homeland, and when the old people started mentoring me from the mountains to the rivers and to the ocean and back to the land and all its beautiful resources that we go by probably during the four seasons of the year and the different plants that, that um, come to life and like you know like the rattlesnake plantain it's just one of them that uh, is a variety of plantains that is around year round and it has so many benefits that could be using it and the wild ginger is one that I learned from Auntie Ellen when went picking with her and uh, she told me if the forest were ever to clear cut and take everything the wild ginger would be lost in that place. It would never, it can never come back. And it, it is true. We went to one place where they cleared the land and there was no more wild ginger on that, on that piece of land. So, and the different types of crab apple and the true crab apple compared to other crab apples is important to know and where they survive and live. The Salal, uh, I know the salal leaf is a benefit, but also the berries within it is also beneficial, not only to eat at a certain time of year, but to make medicine of these beautiful 
awesome plants within the forest and how to use the berries when you want to make a fruit roll up they call it but in in our language it's different but we combine the berries to make a fruit roll up thanks Geraldine I have a little wild ginger plant I will gift you the next time I see you I've been growing a little bit of it um, I'll just go back to um, people. You often hear people talking about traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge, sometimes traditional ecological knowledge and wisdom, which is my preference. And it doesn't, just because it's traditional doesn't mean that it's only in the past. It means that it's grounded in, in years and generations of knowledge and traditions. And uh, it's defined by my friend Fikret Burkus in his book, Sacred Ecology, as a cumulative body of knowledge, practice, and belief, evolving by adaptive processes and handed down through generations by cultural transmission. And you see I have a photo of my dear friend Helen Clifton from Hartley Bay. She's working with her little granddaughter, Janelle. And there, Janelle is learning about knowledge that is important to her survival in the future but she's having fun with her grandma and she's just participating in while she's learning feel free to just jump in anytime Geraldine as we go through these slides but I'll just talk a little bit more about this amazing knowledge system that's held in every family, in every community, in every language group. And it's, um, it's a very broad, integrated, holistic knowledge. And uh, Geraldine's al already told us a little bit about the respect and gratitude that is in, embodied in this language, the worldview or the, the values that people hold all kinds of practical knowledge about where to go to get what you need to survive, how to prepare it, how to store it, and that kind of thing. The ways the knowledge is passed on, the educational component is part of it, and the ways of making decisions. All of those are part of this big, um, complex knowledge system that, to, in my thinking, is equivalent to what one would learn at a university, all of the different subjects that one would learn, from philosophy to biology. And with this worldview and practical strategies, and, um, like we, we think about our way of how we uh, think and respect a certain plant and the uses of and then connected to the university where I'm at, they actually did a study, a research on the plantain because I talk about it so much and Auntie Ellen talked about it too. And they wanted to see what the benefits were within the, the plantain itself. So it went to a whole bunch of test tubes and testing and everything to see the properties of it. And, uh, I will never forgive because uh, she said, you know, it does. What, what we see it has and what you mentioned, what we use it for. I gave her different examples of what the uses were. Like if you had um, this open sore, it's good for that. Uh, it's good for uh, a stinging bee. Uh, proper, and uh, you can actually marry it with another plant. Uh, like the devil's club and that to to make um for pain uh, external pain if you got arthritis or something like that so yes it's in it, and it re right here our indigenous uh, knowledge around this and what the forest holds and i think about it have a conversation with auntie ellen in her time and think gosh here you were raised from a young girl to walk the land and understand the medicines and what their use is for. And right from cancer to asthma to the different um, ailments people have. And you have that knowledge. 
and I thanked her for taking me under her wing to begin training me of what and where to go and what season and what time of day you should go, Haichika. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Haichika. I just wanted to point out the photo in this slide of Dr. Mary Thomas, and look what she's doing. She's harvesting cherry bark for her baskets, but she's being very, very careful not to cut through the inner bark the green part because she won't damage the tree that way she just takes off the outer a sheet of the outer covering but the tree will continue to live and she was always careful to do that when she harvested her cherry bark or her birch bark so these are some of the traits that are embodied in indigenous knowledge it's long term it's based on multiple generations of of knowledge practice and belief but it's adaptive to different changing times because people have lived through changing times since the since the beginning of memory um it it's a, a cumulative so it piles one on top one on top of the other it's both generalized and general and specialized um experiential and experimental and there's a whole lot of knowledge that's the body and language and stories and ceremonies. And it's placed, it's focused on the, the place where people live, where the community holds the knowledge, their place, the knowledge is most focused on that place. Anything to add there, Geraldine? I, I was looking at the salmonberry color forms that, that Salmon berries are no, not only uh, for eating and things like that, but the roots of it, uh, along with the devil's club, it has color. The red cedar has color that mm -hmm. old people used for the paint. Like the black, the devil's club is for the black paint and, you know, the red cedar and the salmon berry, you know, it's for the red. Yeah, I think about this, but then I think about you also have... Um, Embodied in language. RCM, ZITOCM, HITZIEPKA. To clear the obstacles on the path, knowing where I'm going, to keep me safe, and knowing at the other end what I'm seeking will show, produce themselves. So it will be saying that in our language when we go or we do the prayer before, the day before, and get up early morning and not tell anyone where we're going. You notice a big old cedar tree here in the Gitkat territory that has had some sheets of bark taken from it many years ago, maybe two different occasions. This tree is still growing and living. It must be about 500 years old or more. And the Devil's Club there that uh, Geraldine mentioned. So this is just really reinforcing what Geraldine has already talked about, how the spiritual aspects of this knowledge are very, very important. And you can see it in the, in the artwork, in the stories, in the ceremonies that people have that help them to retain the knowledge and, and to apply it in a good way. There's another example um, how, how traditional management, we could say, if we think of management as being man from our hands, the way we use our hands to, uh, to promote the quality and uh, the value of the things that we harvest. And this photo of Nani Florence Davidson from Masset, um, shows a, a woman that's who's taking cedar bark from a tree on Haida Gwaii and you notice she's pulling off a strip of it and she's being very very careful people ask me sometimes um, well isn't she damaging the tree when she does that well yes it's ironic though because in behind her 
there's a huge clear cut where the trees are not only damaged, but the entire ecosystem is damaged terribly. And so the way people use resources and work with them is a much more gentle, more uh, less impactful way of using resources. We all need to use resources, but how we relate to them, how we interact with them, and our responsibility to them, that's what Indigenous knowledge systems embody. When I was going up to the mountains, I get ready to go to the mountains. Auntie had to put me through a story. When you go to somebody's house, what do you do when you approach it? Do you knock on the door? Do you walk in? What do you do? Knock on the door and announce myself. So when we go to the mountain, you're going to get prepared by doing your prayers at night and do your bathing. And when we go to the mountain, you're going to stand at the entrance and sing a song or do a prayer acknowledging who you are because all the beautiful trees in that forest are witnessing you coming forward. And they will guide you to where the plant or whatever you're going in that forest for because it's their home. If you misuse and don't follow those practices, your eyes will be blind even though they're open because you won't be able to find what you're going in for. So always go to the forest with a clear, a mind that's focused on the plant or the root or the berries, whatever you're going for, and say, Haichika, thank you. Guide me, do your prayer by asking for guidance, etc. So that's what she said, enter the, enter the forest by acknowledging grandmother and grandfather cedar tree, and they will allow, bring out either the eagle or the raven to take you where you need to go. Hi, Chika. I smile as I hear Geraldine talking because I've heard those words and that advice so many times from so many different people all around this region. Thank you. So of course, there are many, many, what we could call resources, forest resources that people rely on, have relied on for thousands of years. Fibers, wood, branches, um, berries for food, greens, medicinal plants, all of these things have provided people with a rich uh, life, um, have made them prosperous, um, have made, have given them joy and pleasure. And these things are still there today. Anything to add, Geraldine? I think you said it just perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and there's the rattlesnake plantain that Geraldine talked about. Um, we have to remember that the forest is not just the trees, although the trees are valuable and important in themselves, but there are many, many different species, shrubs and herbaceous plants, green leaf plants and plants without green leaves, like the one here called Indian pipe, which is, a, and many of them are medicine plants for different people. There's the mosses and the lichens and the fungi as well. And all of the animal life that depends on these plants and on, on the trees themselves as habitat, all of these are components in the forest and they're all valued. So just quickly, um, because our time is going quickly, uh, we'll just run through some of the ways that forests are important for First Nations. And we've already talked about this a bit, all the different ways in material culture that forest species are important for wood, for tools, for construction and fuel, dyes and glues and fibers, for clothing and cordage and nets. And then again, the forest is also important for an individual going up for um, 
meditating, mm -hmm. connecting with one of the elements within the forest to do that meditation to get their inner spirit connected and grounded to whatever spiritual advisor they may be, the forest is a place to go. I've heard that too many times. Uh, the trees are your grandmothers. If you need help, if you need advice, go and be with a tree and the answers will come to you. It's my dear friend Ellie Claxton from Tseot, um, showing the cedar boughs and how they're used for basketry. And there's a basket that's made, uh, probably a basket for, what, Geraldine, would you say for clams or something like that, an open work basket made with cedar? Yeah, it would be huge for something like harvesting, going out harvesting within the water area because of the openness and it's not so tightly uh, made. But uh, yeah, for clams or if they're on a farm, they use it there. Uh -huh. And this comes from, uh, recorded by France Boas and George Hunt back in the early 1900s. Um, they were told the same thing. They do not take all of the cedar bark for the people of the olden times said that if they should peel off all the bark, the young cedar would die. Then another cedar tree nearby would curse the bark peeler so that he would also die. That's a very, very strong belief. Therefore, the bark peelers never take all the bark off a young tree. So that says it all. You can use the tree, but don't kill the tree. The, the life of the tree is important. So, and then also, you know, wherever you may be, recognize a cultural modified tree and what it would look like, where the how it was stripped and maybe how old it is, because the more, the older it is, it, the bark comes together again, it closes up. But yeah, it's called a CMT tree, um, and it's right across um, the island within BC. Yes, CMTs, that's right. Here's another example from, again, from Mary Thomas, you saw uh, taking the cherry bark, and she talks about it. Once the bark is taken off, she's talking about uh, the birch trees here, because she used to make the most beautiful birch bark baskets. Once the bark is taken off, the inner part will turn into a hard surface that protects the tree the pulp, the juice will still go up and makes, make leaves and it keeps the tree alive. And so the life of the tree is important. And then we have, Geraldine's already talked about some of the forest foods that are available, the salmon berries, the salal berries, blueberries and huckleberries, teas, pitch for chewing gum. Have you ever chewed pitch, Geraldine? No, I, no. I've tried it. It's kind of strong at first, but it, it's good after a while. A lot of my friends have talked about how they used to chew, that was their chewing gum as children, and it's supposed to be good for your teeth. Mm. And then, yes, the different kinds of medicines. There's Elsie Claxton again. She used to make a medicine for her family and other people who needed it, called the Ten Barks Medicine. And it came from the trees, uh, the bark of 10 different kinds of trees and shrubs and was sweetened with licorice fern and, and blackberry leaves. And I tasted it. One time we went and made it with my friends, Delilia, Belinda, Belinda Claxton, Elsie's daughter. We tasted it and it was like tasting the forest. It was like drinking the forest. It was just a wonderful flavor. And just quickly, another recipe for uh, medicine from the Gitsan people. Again, bark medicine with devil's club, spruce, and uh, juniper. All of these are forest species that have great value wherever they grow.
And we see another kind of culturally modified tree here. These are trees that long ago, somebody took a piece of bark from for medicine. But you see again, they didn't girdle the tree. They would have talked to the tree, they would have offered a gift to the tree. And then they took a small rectangular piece. And you can see the trees in both cases, the crab apple and alder are healing themselves. There's Mary again, making another kind of medicine from the red osier dogwood. And I watched her while she harvested this. She went up to the bush and she actually talked to the bush and asked for its help before she took a branch from it and, and she offered it a gift of tobacco and, uh, and then made this medicine that you put boiling water on and it's used as a poultice for sores and swellings and wounds. Toothache as well. And then you can take a look um, and each, each area where these dogwoods are found, that they have their traditional names attached mm -hmm. to it. Just like here within Sanemo, we have our plants that are, have traditional names attached to it. And uh, like my traditional name is Atasia, uh, so does the berries that um, all the old people use were given a name. So yeah. Yeah, every one of these plants that we've been talking about has a name wherever it's grown, wherever it's growing um, in the language, there's a name for it. And that, that uh, is so important to know about. The cedars have very, and some of the other conifer trees have aromatic oils you can tell if you just rub the branches a little and smell it you can smell these delicious fragrant compounds that are released and people use those for medicine and i know um one of my friends said she always remembered well mary thomas too she always remembered the old people would have a big pot of cedar boughs on the back of the stove she said they never got colds or they never got sick because that, that helped to protect them and purify the air. And with the aromic oils, not only from the red cedar, but the other, there are other ones that um, we go out and get, like this one, how the cedar boughs are, are um, in the soaking in the water. And then we have the uh, lavender, uh, we also make oils out of, and I uh, forgot the other one I used, but yeah, sage. But I just made some, um, it, rather than going to the store and getting a spray the house with their thing, I make my own. And uh -huh. I was complimented yesterday because my niece came into my home and said, what's that smell? I sure like that smell. Um, but yeah, it has beautiful aromas. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Geraldine. Uh, my friend Tina from uh, Hartley Bay, um, another kind of culturally modified tree, CMT, is a pitch tree. And some, some of these pitch trees were kept for generations in a family where they would make a cut in, in the tree and it releases pitch which then could be collected and heated and mixed with uh, animal fat or more recently people use Vaseline and uh, beeswax and make a, a medicinal salve for cuts and wounds from that. That's what Tina's doing here. And the licorice fern, to seep, is another really interesting and beautiful forest plant. It likes to grow in mossy areas on maple and sometimes alder or crab apple or other trees. And the rhizome, the underground stem is the part that you, if you chew on it, it's very, very sweet. It has a compound that's six, five or 600 times sweeter than sugar by taste. 
And so that's used for sweetening medicine or for sweetening your mouth or as a flavoring. And um, it's well known up and down the coast. Everybody has a name for it. Have you used this one, Geraldine? Oh, yes. I actually went um, walking the forest um, that time of season and went and got some of it because what you talked about the roots and that and the flavor of it and not only using for sore throats and that cause, but also as a sweetener. But you can also, I think the old people say you can take it and to um, not get so hungry. Oh, an appetite suppressant. Yes. I've heard that as well. If you're hungry and you don't have anything to eat, you just chew on that. Yeah. And it helps hold your hunger for a while. Yes. Yeah. That's right. And good for sweetening tea and as well. Yeah. So and, and it's a medicine for coughs and colds. I've seen that medicine in people's refrigerators where they make it up and keep it like a cough syrup. My friend, our friend, Dr. Richard Atlio, who is with the First Nations Studies Program at VIO for many years, um, was the co-chair of the Clockwood Scientific Panel. And he shared these words, the creator made all things, all things are related and interconnected, all things are sacred, all things are therefore to be respected. And that, um, the people who worked with the Clockwood Scientific Panel all related to those words and realized um, this is a perspective on the forest that's different from what we see often in the Western economic system. So, again, the life of a tree is important. Trees are relatives. Trees are beings, living beings that need to be respected. They're generous relatives because they provide for us what we need. But we, in turn, have a responsibility to them. My friend Daisy Seward Smith talked about that in this quote. I also um, talked about the life of a tree, and uh, they are they they portray this energy. And if you're really connected, when you're out in in the forest, like I was going early bathing up the mountain, and I needed the cedar boughs, and uh, to be respectful, you just don't pull on it and tear it off. You have to shake it and announce what you're going to use it for to wake up the tree, because if you startle it, that cedar bough is not, branch is not gonna come down. So, and I believe that truly in my heart because it happened to me early one morning when I was in a rush, um, going up to do the early bathing and I needed those cedar boughs and I just yanked on it. And all of a sudden the energy of the whole area, it, it woke up with a growling noise. And I said, oh no, I woke up, I, I didn't follow protocol. I should have gently awakened this tree before I pulled on the, on the branch. So in the metaphor part, I would tell my students, how would you like to be awoken? Come, someone come in and just shake you and pull you up, that would startle you. Or if you gently um, be woken up to a soft voice and a gentle shake, is two different things. It's the same when you go and do the sacred work up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Geraldine. I see our time is going quickly, and uh, we have a few more slides left. Um, but, yeah, we have just a few minutes. So um, I'm going to just go through these quite quickly um, so that we finish up on time. And then um, I want to leave a few minutes for Geraldine to complete our presentation. So these are, again, talking to Cedar is, is something that people would do, just as Geraldine talked about. If you need something, you talk to the plant, you talk to the tree. 
And uh, this is uh, Chris Pilu from the Clockwork Scientific Panel. We learned a lot about commercial forestry when we were working on the panel. And I was interested that Cat Face Mountain in Clockwork Sound is named for the culturally modified trees there, which are called cat faces in forestry. And we see from many different sources how people are worried about industrial logging and how it's transformed the landscape in so many areas. And we see kind of the perspective, it's from some time ago, but untilled fields, buried minerals or standing forests are of no value except for the wealth which through industry can be produced there. From. That's from the forests of British Columbia. And uh, it, it hurts me to look at that phrase when I, when I read it, because that's the perspective that people hold sometimes. Logging is the commercial whaling of the forest. And we don't need to say very much about what's been going on in our forests in British Columbia over the past decades, past century. So much has been destroyed. And that's meant lost habitat. And so we need, I think all of us need to look at a different ways of knowing and learn from different ways of knowing and don't think that we in Western, in the Western mainstream society, um, using the knowledge system that we've learned can actually manage the environment the way we think. And the problems of today are complex. Science alone cannot solve these problems. Climate change, biodiversity loss. We need as much, as many different approaches and different ideas to, to help solve these problems as we can get. Indigenous people's knowledge is really, really important as we make our way forward in the world. We're all here together. We're all in the same canoe. I've heard people say that. And we need uh, better communication, better education. We need partnerships. And we need to think about ethno-ecological restoration, a long-term vision. Linking together ecosystems and cultural systems is very important. What we call now bio, biocultural diversity. That's what we need. We need holistic perspectives. We need to think about the value of each tree, not just whole logs going off offshore. We, and we need that long-term vision. Working with nature, natural processes help renew what has been lost. And nature, thank goodness, nature is so resilient. And we have learned so much from First Nations too. And they are resilient because they've been through so much and so many different traumas. But nevertheless, we are blessed with wise people like Geraldine who can advise us today. The Haida have a thousand-year plan for renewing cedars on Haida Gwaii. I think that's a, something that all of us can draw inspiration from. So with that, um, Geraldine, I'll leave you to make the last words. First, I want to thank you, Nancy. I want to thank you, Jennifer, for being here, for guiding us through this process of bringing just a tip of the iceberg of knowledge uh, within a forest or within the salt water or within the fresh water. So many different um, plants, uh, roots, uh, to the different type of trees and how we use their bark and how culturally we 
me the protocol of what we need to do even before we leave our home and getting prepared to make something out of something that's waiting for us up in the forest. So all those who are listening and have watched this, this, there's so much, this topic can go on for hours, but we only have a limited time. But please uh, look around in your communities. What do you see from the ground up? Aichika. Thank you so much, Geraldine. Thank you, Jennifer. It's a pleasure being with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Geraldine and Nancy at Pechiqua. Did I say that right? Pechiqua. That's the word for thank you. Is that correct? Pechiqua. Because you're talking to us, Pechiqua. I'd say Ipka when you're talking to more than one person, but when you're talking to one, Heitschka. Heitschka. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, just a, a couple of comments and questions. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the phrasing that you've been using throughout this presentation is so different from the, the modern industrial approach to forestry. When I hear uh, phrases like, keeping it living, drinking the forest, uh, the life the life of the tree is what's important, uh, doing things with care, protocols for conservation, um, and talking about a gentle, respectful approach to, to a tree rather than barging in and taking what we want. It's, the, it's a, it's a two-way relationship. It's not just about taking, it's about giving you know you you've taken some boughs from the tree but you've given back a gift of tobacco and that's so different from the the conceptualization and the attitudes of industrial forestry and corporate forestry where the number one priority is timber volumes which is also known as profits and it's about taking and turning it into money rather than living together with or living in harmony with with that which sustains us so thank you so much I, I feel like I just went through an hour-long meditation <laughs> it feels like oh, I feel so relaxed now listening to you, this this conversation about the forest um so I'd like to ask you both if I'm going to ask this question of all of the guests in our summit uh, for you to share an example of a group of people or individuals who have been successful at managing the forest in the way that you've spoken of, people who are still doing it right now or who have managed to come back to doing it that way, are there groups or individuals that you're aware of who, who are successfully doing these practices? I would like to say that within my community and neighboring community, I should say, uh, those who have a specific skill, specific knowledge of connecting to what's in the forest and on the forest ground, what are they after? Following the protocols that have been handed down time and time again, how to enter, how to preserve, etc. So yeah, yeah, we do have people in our community that follow those protocols and are continuing doing it today. Thank you. Thank you for that. Nancy? Um, and in terms of uh, forestry itself, um, I'd like to acknowledge the work of Herb Hammond, who is very well known uh, in the area of uh, selective sustainable forest practices and the, work, the books that he's done. And he's worked with the... Uh, Slatnimuch and the Niska and other First Nations, Haida, Haida as well, um, to help develop uh, forestry plans that maintain the integrity of the forests at the same, at the same time as using some of the trees. And um, I belong to the Ecoforestry Institute Society, and uh, we have the stewardship of a property um, uh, in Yellow Point that was owned originally by Merv Wilkinson 
and many people know that uh, Wildwood is an example of a forest that Merv harvested from uh, extensively since the 1930s. But if you go to Wildwood today, you'd have to look closely to see that the forest has actually been um, harvested. Very different from going onto a, a clear cut. Very it's, different. It's very obvious what's what's happened there and and it's all about taking and, and not giving back. So thank you for sharing this lovely, um, heartening, uh, meditative uh, treatment of the forest and, and living in harmony with it. And one of the things that we're trying to do uh, with this with this gathering, this people's convergence, is we're trying to work our way towards building a new forest framework that respects nature and indigenous systems and gives power back to communities. And we're hoping that we're bringing together the people who want to do this so that we can unify our efforts, we can build a network, and we can revitalize a movement. Uh, and, and also to create the political will, because I think that's one of the things that's lacking to, to move in this direction. There's a lot of people in British Columbia, Indigenous people, non-Indigenous people, city dwellers, rural dwellers, small town people who want to see a movement in this direction, but the political will is lacking. So I'm putting this question to all of our uh, guests as well. What Do you have a suggestion for how we, and now this is a big question, <laughs> it's not an easy one, and there's no wrong answer, I'm looking for ideas. Uh, do you have a suggestion for how we might create the political will to move in this direction? Nancy, we'll start with you maybe. Well, I'm delighted to see the little girl behind Geraldine because to me, she is the future. She's the one who will benefit from the care and attention that we pay today to looking after the forests and, and our environments. So I'm very glad that she's here with us because it reminds us all of that. And, and also uh, a reminder that forests grow at a certain rate. And if you start cutting trees faster than they can grow, you will deplete your forest. And that's what we've done. And uh, Merv was very careful at Wildwood not to cut more trees than would, would, be, would be replaced by the growth of the trees. And, and it's important to remember too that the trees uh, and the forest is a three-dimensional habitat. It's not just an area on the ground, but there is dimension to it. And all of the, the canopy of the forest is what produces the oxygen that we breathe, that uses up the carbon dioxide, and that serves as habitat for countless species of insects and arachnids and birds and so forth. So we have to think of forests um, in terms of volume, and if you think of an old growth forest versus a plantation forest, you know, the old growth forest is many times more habitat available to, to, uh, to serve, if you want to say, to serve what we need in the, in the human community. It's not a, a solution, as you're asking, but I just wanted to say, to remind people about that as we as we think of what is a, a way forward that will not be more harmful to the habitat that we depend on. Very good. Thanks for that reminder. Very important, Nancy. Thanks for that. Geraldine, what, were your, what are your thoughts on this? Well, my thoughts are particular close to the same, you know, passing our wisdom, passing, sharing with you, you know, sharing with... Um, organizations like uh, those who have um, forest companies like Timber West and uh, sitting with them, walking with them, letting them know what, what's at risk and what needs to be protected. And also through the universities that we're connected to, you know, we use them a lot uh, to, be, to make that voice even stronger when it comes to land base and the environment. Nancy and Geraldine, this has been a beautiful, lovely way for me to spend my afternoon today. Thank you so much.
How how would I say goodbye in your language, your traditional language, Geraldine? Hiawis. Hiawis? Hiawis. Hiawis. Yeah. 